Hello. Uh, my name is Brooklyn, and I am a community member of the True Education Network. Um, we're here today with John McNamara from the Northwest Cooperative Development Center um, to share with us the um, history and functions of worker cooperatives and how they might serve our communities. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I have a few slides here that I refer to as cooperation, the other market economy, and um, but uh, and we'll get into more of that and talk about what co-ops are and how they work in the marketplace and then kind of what makes them different from uh, the, what's considered the traditional market economy. Uh, just a little bit about myself first. Uh, I um, spent 26 years with uh, Worker Co-op in Madison, Wisconsin, Union Camp of Madison Cooperative, which was about 250 people who drove, fixed, and dispatched cabs. Uh, I then moved out west to Olympia, Washington, where I joined with the Northwest Cooperative Development Center about six years ago. Along the way, I got a master's in co-op management and a program at St. Mary's University in Halifax, and then continued there to finish a PhD in business administration. The Northwest Cooperative Development Center is a 501c3 organization based in Olympia, Washington. Uh, we serve a three-state area, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, although we will often go outside of that if people ask us to or, or want to work with us, but our prime area is, is in this tri-state region. Most of our funding comes through the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development Program uh, through a number, a couple of different grants uh, for rural communities. So most of our work is in rural communities, but we do also work in urban areas. Um, our work kind of divides into two or three core areas. So one of the, the biggest one is our resident owned communities. And these are manufactured home parks uh, where we work with the residents to buy the land underneath their uh, manufactured home. And then they own it together as a cooperative. We work in partnership with uh, Rock USA, which uh, also has its own uh, capital organization to help uh, finance these sales. Another key part of our work uh, recently has been with uh, home care co-ops. Home care agencies are the fastest growing industry in the country, but they pre predominantly low wage and um, low, uh, low hours, scheduled hours for home care workers. So by owning their own agency, they're able to maximize both hours and pay and be able to control, have some control over their lives. And then the third major focus is helping existing businesses convert either to worker ownership or to a form of solidarity ownership, which involves having different stakeholder groups uh, be members. So you might have the workers and the consumers be members, or something else along those lines. And then finally, we do everything else that's co-op, except pretty much we don't do much with rural electrics uh, or with credit unions since they kind of have their own uh, own world, but we're doing a lot of work around platform co-ops and independent contractor co-ops now, and so it's it's kind of wide open on what's happening. And we have a staff of about eight people, I should say. So it's eight people doing about 80 projects at any given time, plus events like this. So we're pretty busy these days. So the first thing I like to ask is what people think of, uh, or when they hear the word cooperative uh, or think of it, what comes to mind? Um, cooperation, of course, has been around for a long time, and, and people have a lot of ideas of what co-ops are. Um, in this scheme, uh, we can see there's a lot of uh, very common names here. Not all of these are cooperatives, but it's uh, thinking about which ones immediately come to you as a cooperative. And just take a few seconds to think about that. Um, you'll probably be surprised on some that are and some that aren't. That's what I'm hoping. I only see a couple that yeah. I didn't even think. Yeah, so these, uh, these are the ones that was from the previous screen. So some are really nationally well-known names like Sunkist, Welch's, Nationwide Insurance, uh, Liberty Mutual. Um, you know, if, if you watch any mainstream television right now, you're probably seeing ads for Nationwide and Liberty Mutual are familiar with them. Organic Valley. Uh, but even like Best Western and, uh, and Ace Hardware, these are sometimes called marketing co-ops. So the individual stores are owned by local business owners, 
but they feed into a national branding and marketing uh, co-op, and that's what allows them to maintain a small hardware store and compete against uh, Lowe's or some of the other big boxes. Likewise, Best Western is able to compete against Marriott because it's able to combine local ownership with uh, and meeting the needs of local ownership with a larger branding. And then, of course, uh, you have your major producer co-ops like Welch's and, and Organic Valley. Now, I, uh, I love the, I always throw Green Bay Packers on, I should say, because they're the only publicly owned uh, football or pro sports franchise. They're owned by their stock corporation, but most of their stock is owned by a VFW Hall in, in Wisconsin. And, uh, but they do have 30 or 40,000 different stockholders. So they are kind of unique, but they're not a co-op. A lot of people confuse that. So a working definition for co-ops, this comes from the US Department of Agriculture is what's often called the user principles. And uh, it's basically that the people who use the co-op should own and finance the co-op. The people who use the co-op in this, and by use we mean either by being a consumer, using it for marketing or using it for wages. Uh, they should also be the people who control the co-op. And then finally, the co-op's sole purpose is to provide and distribute benefits to users based on their use of the co-op. So this is very different from a traditional capitalist model where the, everything would be about the stockholders, not the people who use it. There may be no connection. And we'll go a little bit more into that here. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the uh, what's called the cooperative identity. This, this is an international uh, agreed upon uh, statement on what a cooperative is. And this was drafted 25 years ago in 1995, uh, mainly to address the uh, <clears throat> re-emerging economies from the planned uh, economy system of the Eastern Bloc or Warsaw Bloc nations. And so uh, often the word cooperative was kind of misused as meaning anti-capitalist, which although it's not a capitalist organization, it's still a market plan. Uh, and so they wanted to re get a, a clear understanding. And in this case, uh, the definition is uh, very similar to the user definitions. The cooperative is autonomous and it's owned to meet the social, economic, and cultural needs and aspirations of its members through a democratic and jointly owned enterprise. Um, and this uh, <clears throat> plays out quite a bit in how the different co-ops operate and engage with each other again. Uh, while wealth generation may be one of those uh, common economic needs, it's not necessarily the only need in a cooperative. In addition to uh, that definition, the Cooperative identity also establishes uh, six values and four ethics. So specifically the idea that of what's sometimes called mutual self-help and self-responsibility, that it's up to the people who are members of the co-op to really work and take the responsibility of ownership to solve their own problems. And that kind of ties in with uh, the idea of equality and equity, but also solidarity, that you're helping each other while you're helping yourself. And, and then, of course, in the ethics is that because everyone has an equal say in the business, it should be based on openness and honesty. But then there's also that these are community organizations and therefore they should be good um, community citizens in their own right by caring for others in their community, caring for the stakeholders that may not be members in their organization, but still rely on that organization and having being good corporate citizens as well. That was probably most uh, now most known by people are what are called the co-op principles. These principles developed in the 1840s in uh, Rockdale, England. But uh, these are the seven basic principles of cooperation: again, voluntary and open membership, um, having democratic control, one member, one vote. It doesn't matter how much you use the co-op or how much you have invested in the co-op. You still have only one vote. It's based on a person, not a share of stock. Uh, commitment to education, information, and training, as well as uh, cooperation among cooperatives and then caring for community as well. We'll could talk a little bit more about some of those as we go through this. So just to give you an idea on how they compare, I like to take uh, two organizations that are both national organizations, but based in uh, the state of Washington. And uh, or, but first, I'll get before that. Let me go through the strict thing. So, so uh, it's a member owned versus investor owned. So, member owned means it, oper it still operates on market principles, 
Um, and likewise with the investor owned company, they also operate on market principles. If people don't want what you're selling, then uh, it's not gonna be a feasible organization. The, the base unit though of voting power in, a, in the co-op is uh, the individual worker or, in, or one member one vote if it's a consumer co-op. Whereas investor owned, it's about uh, how many shares of stock a person owns. So one person could own 50.1% of the shares and that gives them complete control over the organization. Whereas uh, even if someone has 50.1% of the equity in a co-op, they still only have one vote. Again, going back to that definition, the purpose of the enterprise and the worker co-op, and I'm using as a model here, is to create stable and meaningful employment usually. Uh, whereas the purpose of investor owned is to maximize return on investment. There's also a secondary purpose, which is to build community for co-ops. And this is kind of regardless of that uh, membership stake that co-ops are part of their community. They live in their community. And so therefore it's about building it. In the uh, investor owned world, many of the stockholders may not live anywhere near the community where the business is organized or based out of. Their secondary purpose is actually to increase the rate of return on investment. So you'll sometimes see a corporation in the news post a record profit and then have their stocks drop because they didn't meet their profit goal for that year. It's kind of crazy to think about, but that's a really different model. And that's part of what ratchets it up uh, investor owned businesses to get bigger because they have to get bigger. Otherwise, they're not succeeding. Whereas members uh, owned businesses succeed by meeting the needs. And then finally, the duty of uh, a member owned business is to its mission and the membership. Whereas, again, the investor owned value is, is duty to shareholder value. As a, one of my mentors likes to say, if an uh, investor owned business is polluting a stream and the fine for polluting that stream is less than the cost to fix the source of pollution, they have a legal obligation to continue polluting the stream to their shareholders. Whereas the co op would be able to make that decision and say, no, we're going to fix this pollution, source of pollution. So to give a practical uh, demonstration of this, we can look at these two organizations based in Washington, uh, Costco Wholesale, which is a national um, distributor and uh, producer of uh, all sorts of things. And then REI Co-op, which is also a national distributor and producer uh, more focused in a particular uh, market on outdoors equipment. So for Costco, um, one needs to be a member to shop in the store, um, or you can pay a surcharge if you're online. So your membership is about being able to shop there, uh, but that membership is only for shopping. Voting rights are reserved for the actual shareholders of Costco, not for people who are members of Costco. There's an annual fee, and uh, if you want to rebate, you get a you get a higher you pay a higher annual fee. The shareholders don't have to be members of Costco. The shareholders are simply investors. They, they never shop at Shopco. Um, and the shareholders have voting power based on how much they've invested. REI, on the other hand, you don't need to be a member to shop there. There's no surcharge. But if you are a member, you get uh, a dividend at the end of the year. You also get to uh, vote for and maybe serve on the board of directors. Um, you do pay, you pay a one-time fee and your rebates start with that first dollar spent. Um, all the shareholders of REI are members, which means they, you know, have paid their membership fee and, you know, whether or not they're still shopping at REI, they still are members. Um, shareholders voting power is based on being a member. So majority of individual members would make voting decisions. And the way um, part of it works is, um, is I think for REI, you have to spend at least $10 a year to have a voting membership. Otherwise, uh, you're still a member and you still get that rebate, you just don't have voting power. So this is kind of really impractical how, uh, how even in a big sort of national organization, uh, the co-op model is, is fundamentally different uh, from the investor model. So there are different sectors or what we call sectors. Uh, the, the primary ones, the, the there are really, I would argue, four primary ones, uh, and that are that is producer co-ops, which might be the older model here in the United States, um, and that's uh, you know farmers and who are individual farmers but join these co-ops to help market their their goods. Uh, there are consumer co-ops, which are also pretty common now, uh, and that's where the consumers own the business. Worker co-ops, where the workers own the business. And then um, 
there's what's called the solidarity co-op model. And this is where you have the different stakeholders. So fifth season has a membership track for farmers, consumers, um, distributors, and um, corporate consumers, et cetera. And then some of these others uh, like Nationwide, again, OB Credit Union, these are financial co-ops. These are essentially gonna be producer co-ops. Likewise, shared services are essentially, uh, well, financial co-ops are essentially consumer co-ops, sorry. Shared services co-ops tend to be more closer to the producer co-op model, but this is basically whatever sector you happen to be in, whether you're creating something or buying something or selling something, there's a co-op model for you that works for that, for that group. Okay, and then kind of finally, just to put this more into an academic and, uh, and universe, uh, you know, there's in, in the economy, there's basically, you can map it out as whether activities are being directed by or towards others or whether they're self-directed and then whether the activities are benefiting others or benefiting the self. So you see at one end of this, um, you have the state government, foundations and charities, and that's basically um, philanthropic, but also about redistribution. On the other end of it, you have uh, private enterprises that are really market focused and definitely about uh, individualistic and supporting uh, individual growth and, and the power that comes with that wealth. And then, you know, in the middle, we have the cooperatives. So the cooperatives will really touch and mutuals, I should say, I forgot to mention. So whenever you see the word mutual, like insurance, uh, like Liberty Mutual, uh, that usually means it's based on a cooperative concept. So cooperatives kind of sit right in the middle here, We're definitely leaning into the market uh, economy, especially in terms of industrial uh, and worker co-ops. But there's also this community aspect to it. And there's this um, overall structure of mission-based uh, work as opposed to a strict market-based work. And so in a way, this allows co-ops and mutuals to engage pretty much wherever there's economic activity in, in the community. And it's just a matter of trying to find what is the right fit and uh, where, where are co-ops going to flourish the best and how you set up the structure. And because of that, the, usually the co-op laws that exist in most states uh, are, are, are pretty flexible to allow co-ops to manage uh, both the mission and market-based dynamic within the organization. And if your state doesn't actually have a co-op law in the United States, so we're fortunate enough that you can actually incorporate in whatever state you want to incorporate in. So you can actually shop around and find a state that has the co-op law that works for what you want to do and then organize there. And uh, in fact, one of, uh, one of my colleagues, Jason Weiner, who's an attorney in Colorado, he's, his goal in life is to make Colorado the uh, Delaware of co-ops. That's uh, so he's been working pretty hard to try to build as much flexibility and different laws as possible into what's happening in Colorado. <clears throat> and then just a word about economies. Uh, you know, I do say it's the other market economy. Capitalism tends to claim itself as the only market economy, but that's really not the case. But there are basically four sorts of economies that are working in our community, right? And it's based on these ideas. So who benefits, right? And the capitalists, as mentioned, it's the shareholders. For the cooperative, it's the members. For not-for-profits, it tends to be the community. And then for the government, it's citizens. And as the last graph kind of showed, there's a little bit of merging and, and swishing together of all of these. And I'm not going through all of it again, but um, you know, sometimes I, it's important for people to understand that cooperatives may exist as mission-based, but they're also not-for-profit. They're not a not-for-profit in the sense of being a charity. We often call them cost-neutral where their goal is to meet that member need and therefore whatever money they need to generate to meet the needs of their operations and including their capital equipment needs needs to be built into the plan so that they're not, they're not out there asking for donations. If, you're, if your economic model is to seek donations, you're probably looking at being more of a true uh, charity or nonprofit than being a cooperative. So, Ultimately, cooperatives should be able to fund themselves through their economic activity of providing the goods or services. Okay, and then also within the worker co-op world, there tends to be a little bit of confusion over ESOPs, co-ops, and collectives. ESOPs are employee stock ownership plans. That's uh, what it stands for. They were started uh, in, I think, the 70s, 60s. These are actually retirement plans that sit on top of a different co-op 
co cooperative corporate, corporate structure, sorry. So an S corp or a C corp can be an ESOP. And what that means is that a certain uh, part of the workers or employees pay is diverted into shares in the company. The difference though is that <clears throat> Workers rarely have any voting power in those shares. Usually the voting power sits in a trustee. So like last year around this time, New Belgium Brewery, which is 100% owned by their employees, sold itself to a Japanese uh, conglomerate uh, 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 investment fund because the trustee was able to make the argument this was in the best interest of the shareholders. And so that's the point is that the trustee acts in the best interest of the shareholders, which are the retirees of the plan, not necessarily the current workers. And, uh, and then likewise, workers may or may not have a voice in operations. You can set up ESOPs to do some interesting things. I've actually been looking for one where you might have a co-op that also has an ESOP aspect to it to create a nice retirement plan. And that way there'd be some protection against being sold out from under you, but it's, uh, they're not co-ops and uh, they are considered employee ownership. And that's not really even, I would argue is accurate either because the employees don't really have control over their shares. And then on the other side of the continuum are collectives. So collectives are organizations where all the voting powers in the member that feels like a co-op, often they use consensus instead of majority voting. Um, Usually the collectives are everyone's in part of every aspect of the organization and there's not necessarily a formal structure. Um, again, collectives can actually work with co-ops. There are a number of consumer co-ops that use a staff collective to manage the store. Um, and there are other ways of doing it. Usually collectives work best when there's fewer than 20 people involved or when uh, also if there isn't a, uh, if there's a really common schedule in a common workplace. So if you have a single restaurant and the restaurant's able to close on Monday and that's the day the collective, everybody in the collective can meet and pretty much there's one shift, you know, for the restaurant, that could be a really great collective model because everybody can be in the room at the same time, make all the decisions, go run the work shifts for the week and then come back and, and work again. But as you get bigger or if you get more workspaces or if you have two or three shifts, suddenly becomes really hard to do collectives. And so the co-op then is able to step in at that point and, and offer some more um, structure. And there's different ways of, of thinking about structures in co-ops that can still keep that sort of collective feel, um, but also allow the co-op to get, or the organizations to get larger. So just a quick history of where this all came from, um, you know, I'd like to throw in. Um, you know, the rise of capitalism, uh, the, some people that I follow pointed back to 1492, which uh, was the first really investment-based extraction of, you know, using empire towards extraction instead of simply uh, expanding empire. And then uh, by the time uh, Adam Smith comes around, it's already pretty much entrenched and he's really reporting back on it. And this created this, uh, this disruption of uh, the relationships between the mercantilists and the feudal relationships uh, started a huge resistance. And that's people were seeing this capitalist model that were throwing people out of traditional industries and forcing people into 16 hour days and child labor and saying there has to be something else. And so <clears throat> people who were demanding uh, universal suffrage for voting power or um, labor unions to engage in that they were starting to push these efforts, uh, mm -hmm. these efforts forward. In the UK, many of these people were imprisoned or deported, and uh, you know, largely is how they populated, uh, you know, Australia and other countries in the empire. But um, a core group was able to finally get the, the co-op starting. In the US, um, a similar battle took place. Only uh, as one uh, one former professor of mine uh, kind of half joked that in the U.S. The Industrial Revolution was actually a hot war, and the Civil War was as much about getting rid of, um, um, you know, chattel slavery, but also replacing it with uh, what was sometimes called wage slavery. And that was also bringing about a lot of cooperation, a lot of efforts to try to do a different economy at the same time. So some of the early cooperators uh, you know, in this country is Ben Franklin, but uh, Robert Owen. Uh, William King were really prominent in getting the Rockdale Pioneers started. In Canada, uh, Alphonse Desjardins uh, helped start the credit union movement. And then in the 20th century, uh, Moses Cody uh, was able to really launch in with um, 
of fisher, fishermen and, and lobster catchers in the Newfoundland and Labrador to help them start a large co-op network. Um, and then uh, Erez Mendionado was a, a Spanish Basque priest in Spain who was able to work with uh, factory workers and, and educate their children and their children grew up to uh, want to work within the values that he taught them. And they started what is now the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain, which is the largest worker cooperative in the world with I think about 170 worker co-ops now and about 250,000 workers. Um, some key moments in North America. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin started the first insurance mutual, the uh, Philadelphia Firemen's Insurance Mutual, which is still in operation today. Um, and But uh, really by the time uh, the Civil War is coming around, uh, some of the first issues of labor movement uh, were aimed at co-ops. So the National Labor Union uh, in the 1860s and then the Grange uh, by the 1870s. And what they were doing is uh, <clears throat> they were starting worker co-ops. So a lot of worker co-ops got started in this time just as the uh, industrialization of the North was happening and getting rid of these cottage industries, much like was happening in the UK. And also, um, you know, taking advantage of uh, the now huge amount of labor available to depress wages and uh, usher in the Gilded Age. Um, in fact, co-ops were considered um, uh, trusts legally um, for many years. Uh, many of the farm trusts, the producer co-ops, and even the insurance co-ops could only operate within their state. If they tried to operate out of state, they would be uh, accused of setting up a financial trust. And the Sherman Antitrust Act was used to actually attack cooperatives for many years until 1922. 1922, uh, co-ops were, were given the same rights as other corporations and they were able to act outside uh, their states and operate in interstate commerce. And that kind of came up right to the Great Depression. And that's when a lot of the modern day producer co-ops get started because co-ops tend to grow when there's uh, economic upheaval. And that's partially because uh, people are desperate. And so, but and in their desperation, they actually come together and they create these things. Likewise, <clears throat> uh, the Southern in the South, there are a number of African American cooperatives that started after Civil War, the Civil War, because they were being forced to by sharecropping and other Jim Crow tactics that kept them out of the traditional economy. They were starting to find and form cooperatives to operate and maintain a separate economy within the country. And, if you haven't read, there's, read it, there's a great book documenting this called Collective Courage by Jessica gordon Emhart, and uh, definitely a recommended read. It's something of a hidden history in the US co-op uh, history, but it's a, it's a pretty important one because it does show that, that co-ops can find a footing wherever they, you know, people find the need for, for mutual aid, I guess. And since we're kind of in that time now, it's, it's a definitely an important lesson for all of us. <clears throat> In Canada, I mentioned Moses Cody. So the work they did in Newfoundland and Labrador became what is called the Antigonish Movement. And it became a large farmer uh, to table co-op system that covered the entire um, maritime provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and, and Nova Scotia. And then by the time the 70s, 60s and 70s come around, people are starting to reevaluate uh, our farming production and the new left and social upheaval from the civil rights and anti-war movement, people really started challenging things. And that's when we see the sort of this new wave of uh, worker co-ops come up that my co-op Union Cab was part of, also Rainbow Grocery Co-op and Equal Exchange as part of the fair trade movement. And so the 70s and 80s really saw this kind of new left and then kind of went dormant uh, for a while, but um, we've since, but then it kind of got a rebirth and, and so when the mentioned the co-op identity, when that uh, when that came into play, then it also created this new energy towards co-ops. And food co-ops had been gotten big enough to start forming their own national organization called the National Co-op Grocers Association. The worker co-ops came together in the early 2000s to form the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. Internationally, there was a lot of effort and the United Nations declared 2012 the year of the co-op which uh, really ratcheted up uh, people's awareness. Also coming right out of the 2008 
uh, financial crisis, um, it really created this, what we kind of referred to as the co-op decade. And now you see a uh, huge growth. So cities like New York City, um, San Francisco, Madison, Wisconsin are now putting uh, dollars, you know, like millions of dollars into co-op development because they believe that uh, creating a cooperative local economy is going to be better than trying to attract jobs from investment organizations. You know, to, if you can get Costco or Amazon to build a, you know, um, a fulfillment a warehouse in your community and give them a huge tax break, you create a, jobs for a few years until that, that grant goes away and then they move to another community. Co-ops are going to stay there forever. And that also led uh, work with the Federation and the National Co-op Business Association to create the Main Street Employee Ownership Act in 2018. It's the first major of uh, worker co-op legislation in, or employee ownership legislation in almost 40 years. This actually uh, mandates <clears throat> the small business development centers and the small business administration to support worker co-ops. And so um, you can go to an SBDC office and they usually, I mean, I think Washington has like 27 different offices. Most relatively large cities have an SBDC or in the counties have an SBDC and they are now have a mandate to work with uh, worker owned businesses. And so this is kind of where we are today. We're seeing this huge groundswell of small business owners who are retiring and the need for, uh, you know, only 20% of them will probably transfer their business to new generation. And so we're trying to help them see their employees as potential um, owners and who they can sell the business to. And we're also trying to educate those workers on what on taking that step from them being an employee to an owner. And um, and we're hoping right to build a co-op century. Okay. <laughs> How am I doing that time? I'm doing okay, right? Um, so uh, and all of this right comes into what is the co-op advantage? And that's something we often talk about when um, when they do national studies and often the National Co-op Association every couple of years will do a consumer study on to get a sense of how co-ops are perceived. What they find is most people when they know what a co-op is will prefer to use shop or use a co-op rather than a non-co-op. The problem is, is most people, like only 25% of people know that what a co-op is when they asked, yet we know that 40% of the population are members of co-ops. So there's this huge block of people who are members of co-ops and don't know it. And so, you know, or they're shopping co-op and they don't know it, right? Because Land O'Lakes doesn't always show that they're a co-op, whereas hardware doesn't really identify as a co-op. So it's, it's kind of funny. But, you know, these are the basic things, right? Co-ops strengthen society. They build high trust relationships. They uh, not only use social capital, they create social capital. So they're operating not just in an economic function, they're also operating in a very social function. And they tend to often more than just material games, they really do create community. So, you know, Union Cab, uh, for example, 250 workers, but that was also families that were, you know, in 2004, our average wage there was over $15 an hour with healthcare benefits for a tax industry that most people were making under minimum wage because they you know, weren't considered minimum wage entitled workers. So, you know, we had cab drivers buying houses, being able to send their kids to school. And, you know, so this is bigger than just that one driver and what they're doing. It's also their whole family and their friends and their network. And again, you know, part of the other advantages are co-ops have a really great ability to respond to failures in the market because they don't have to make that profit model. So, you know, at Union Cab, if, you know, when there is a sudden downturn in the market, if we had to, we could all take a pay cut to get through it. We'd, we weren't going to lay people off. We weren't going to, or we weren't going to leave because, you know, we weren't able to make a 10% or 10% uh, return on investment number, we were only going to make 8%. So we're closing down, we would just say, okay, we're going to suck, you know, get through this for the next year and see what happens. Um, again, very open and transparent. Uh, most co-ops will be very open about what they do. And in fact, one of the great things about doing co-op development is if you're in that same sector, you can find a co-op that's already doing what you're doing. And very often they'll be very open with you, even share their bylaws, often share 
their policies and, and help people get started. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think also co-ops uh, provide yeah, a means for people to overcome unfavorable power dynamics and, and they create places of democracy, places where voices can be heard. We, I've seen people, um, you know, come to like Union Cab uh, houseless and uh, with no skills and suddenly they're on a board of directors and they're making big decisions and they're buying a house and they're, they're not just having material benefit in their life, they're also getting social benefit in their life. And, and then, um, yeah, again, just being more resilient and making better use of resources. I gotta move my thing. So, so kind of do a hard turn here. I just wanna show what some different structures look like. So uh, we're used to a very top-down corporate structure and co-ops can use that. And a lot of producer co-ops will use that and consumer co-ops, worker co-ops, you tend to see really different uh, structures. I wanna go through some of them. So this is, uh, Home Care Cooperative in Wisconsin. They have, I think, they have 55 workers. And so they have an executive director that tries to manage and work with the contracts, but they also have this board of directors. It's made up of seven care workers who are elected. They use team management for their clients. So it's not like one person's off with a client and then goes to another client. They also come back and help that each other with the care for that. And then they have different committees that are made up. They probably include at least one director, but they probably also include a number of the other workers who are coming in, usually on their off time, uh, which may or may not be paid to do the work of trying to create personnel policies or doing the marketing or doing the financing. So it, it tends to be very um, um, malleable, right? You, you can, people can come in, they get hired in, as caregiving, but they can very easily start working in and learning marketing or human resources, personnel, or even bookkeeping, and then start filling these other positions as they become vacant and even uh, you know become members of the board and get extra training and move on. Uh, Equal Exchange is a coffee roaster, a uh, national coffee roaster. They have uh, and fair trade importers, so they also do now all sorts of things, chocolates and fruits and and nuts and but they have a board of directors who are elected by the worker owners and then they have uh, a management council and so the management council is made up of people from the different uh, departments and they have an executive director so the executive director isn't so much a boss as they are um, you know you, you might almost say a juggler really that you know their job is to help coordinate all this activity and make sure that the board knows what's going on and then it's all in line with the what the wish and what the workers want that are set up by the bylaws and the strategic plans and that leading that organization so again a very um it's it's not a very linear structure it can be a very uh flat but it can also have a lot of different goals so i think this next one is union cab so union cab um <clears throat> we actually um were pretty traditional hierarchy and then we decided to change that. So the first thing we did was we took discipline away from management and we created this peer review council. So we had a special council for reviewing accidents. We had a special council for reviewing behavior. Then we had a mediation council to help settle disputes. We had a workers council to uh, hear appeals. And then we created a steward council to help navigate the workers through this whole thing. <laughs> so it's kind of really, crazy. The management team then flattened out and we created this team management where you have different uh, people from like the operations team consisted of dispatchers, phone answers, drivers, mechanics, marketing people, and they would basically look at the operations and tweak it and review complaints and make decisions about training. And actually because of their work, um, they saw a 65% drop in customer complaints over from one year to the next because, um, you know, they were able to actually review it and do things, whereas a single manager trying to review those complaints just wouldn't have time for it. Just like with discipline, discipline fell through the cracks because only one person could, could issue discipline prior to this, and that person already had a full-time job. And then finally, there's a board of directors who they have their policy committees. So we have teams, policy committees, and then the board works uh, with the steering team and, they, and the membership um, and they create the policy code. So something I like to say is <clears throat> in a worker co-op at some point, 
the boss becomes the policy code becomes the boss. So you don't really have a boss in the sense of a person making decisions for you. You have a boss in the sense of it's a policy code. So if you don't like your boss, you don't have to fire that person. You just have to change the tweak the policy that is causing the problem and go through and review it. So it's, it can be really dynamic. Um, again, this is kind of a mix of some hierarchy. Like you still have a dispatcher making the date, the decisions on who gets what call. That's not being done by committee, but you might have some policy in the background about how, what the procedures are for doing that. So it's, uh, it can be very dynamic. And uh, I think what it shows also is that the flexibility in the co-op model operationally is really up to your imagination and, and what do you need it to do to meet your, um, your organization. So Union Cab with 250 workers who at any given time, only a third of them are at work and 80% of the people who are at work are off in their own vehicles. We really needed to have something about accountability because otherwise everyone's just off doing their own thing and it's really hard to be able to communicate. And so we, we, this ended up working really well for Union Cab. And then finally, I want to talk about the money because uh, it is a market organization and there is going to be money. And, uh, and people often ask, how does money work? How does what, you know, if you pay into it, what happens if there's a profit? And I think the first step is determining, you know, the difference between surplus and profit. So in co-ops, we often use the term surplus. Um, and so in this example, um, there's a little bit of a difference. And uh, so in this co-op example, it did $650,000 in income for the year. Once you deduct all the costs and expenses, you're left with, in this case, $111,000. That's net income. And then what happens to that is <clears throat> two things. You have to first determine how much of that activity came from member activity versus non-member activity. So if you're a co-op that, if, so for worker co-ops, it might be 100% is worker activity. But if you're a co-op that maybe has a certain group that are not members uh, versus members, and that happens for different reasons, maybe part-time workers are not going to be offered voting membership for, for whatever reason, then that percentage would be considered profit. So in this case, $11,000 generated by the non-members. This is often why when you go to REI or food co-op, they want your member number because they need to track that because there are different tax rules based on whether you're a member making that purchase or non-member. So this money is going to be taxed at whatever corporate in the income tax rate exists. And, and it just uh, goes into the general fund as uh, retained earnings, usually unallocated retained earnings is the term. And then the balance is called a surplus. So that's the money generated by members. Think of it in this way. Uh, I mentioned that uh, co-ops are cost neutral. So this means that this co-op uh, brought in $100,000 more than it needed to bring in that year to meet its capital and operating budget. And so it has a surplus of $100,000. So for this money, uh, a lot of things can happen and it kind of depends on how the co-op wants to do it. So the first step, usually co-ops will set up a reserve fund and uh, this will be an unallocated retained earnings. So this would go into a general fund. Um, this money uh, is also gonna be taxed at the corporate rate. Um, although, you know, usually what co-ops will do is they'll figure out um, where, how much income they can declare without having to pay a corporate income tax. So there might be, um, you know, tax breaks and stuff they can take advantage of and they determine that amount then so they don't really have a tax balance at the corporate level. And in this case, so they took $25,000 and that's again, unallocated and uh, plus the other 11,000, like $36,000 unallocated. In the future year, if they show a loss, they can then use that money to cover the loss. They don't have to ask members to write a check back to the organization. That leaves $75,000, which is then called a patronage dividend, sometimes called a patronage refund. I like to think of it as a refund. It basically, in a worker co-op, it means we didn't pay you enough last year, so we're going to refund you some wages that you should have had. Or in a consumer co-op, it might mean we charged you too much for you know, your food last year, so we're going to send some money back to you to make up for that. This money is then divvied up based on people's inputs. So 
Um, a union cab, I was full-time and with my seniority, I tended to work about 1% of the total hours of everybody that worked there. And so that's what you would do. You would say, you know, we had 100,000 hours uh, of labor this year. And if somebody has 2,000 hours, that's uh, roughly, what, 2%. So they would get 2% of, uh, of the dividend. In this case scenario, just to give you an example, of, I, I jumped ahead of myself, but <laughs> I always do that. So um, one thing, the first thing the board will do is decide how much to pay out in cash and how much to retain. And so in this case, usually co-ops have to pay out at least 20% in cash. And that's because the individual member is going to be taxed at their individual tax rate for the total amount that's of the dividend. So the IRS will expect income taxes on $75,000. Uh, for most people in most worker co-ops, 20% uh, should be able to cover their tax bracket. And so they have that money then paid towards that tax. And then, uh, and then the other half, in this case, it gets retained. The difference here is that instead of being unallocated, it gets retained in the uh, special member capital accounts. So at Union Cab, there's an account somewhere in their structure where my name shows up and next to my name is the amount of retained equity they still hold in my name. So then we break it down. And so in this scenario, um, so member two here worked the most hours. So they're getting the biggest chunk. So they get $9,000 of the 37,000. And then they also get 9,000 put into their equity account. So they get 18,000 of the 75,000. The member with the lowest looks like member number three. They didn't work as much, so they worked about a third less. So they're getting 12,000. Uh, they get 6,000 in cash. They get 6,000 in their account. Their tax liability will be based on 12,000. So 12,000 by 20%, that's about 2,400. They'll still have about uh, 3,400 or 2,600 and yeah, 3,600 in uh, balance in cash after they've paid their taxes on the whole amount. At some later dates, depending on when the co-op wants to do that, people will receive a check for this amount of money then. And this money will already have been taxed, so there will be no tax liability on it. Some co-ops might pay interest of that money, but then that interest would be taxed. Uh, other co-ops don't. There's no obligation to when to pay it back. I usually encourage co-ops to come up with a payment plan and really manage this. Otherwise, you get a situation like, like you know, say Union Cab, where you know I have money from 1993 still sitting at Union Cab that you know is really supposedly my money, but you know whether or not they'll be able to pay it back. To pay this out, co-ops need to have a robust uh, cash flow. You need to be able to afford to pay out this money because it's not an expense. It's coming directly out of your equity accounts. Uh, then that means you have to maintain a certain amount of profitability to be able to cover the cash flow to be able to, to uh, turn over this uh, equity. Can you say something about why or what, what the goal is to retain some in accounts in the company versus paying it all out in cash? Um, I think uh, part of it is, is um, rainy day funds and just making sure that also uh, funding your capital expenses. So at Union Cab, for example, we owned the cabs that drivers drove, and so we would replace a third of our fleet every year. That meant we needed to generate about seventy to eighty thousand dollars in capital cash that we could actually go out and buy new vehicles. And so, for if you're capital heavy, you probably need to retain more. If your capital, if you don't have a lot of capital, like there's some home care co-ops where, you know, they can be run out of somebody's living room, right, with a with an iPad. They might pay out everything, and, and I know some co-ops that actually don't even wait for the full year. They make quarterly equity payments to their members, and so, in cash. So it's kind of what your capital needs are. Even though your name is next to some fraction of this money in the bank, the co-op can still use it for other purposes and say, "Sorry, we had expenses and we spent your money." Well, right. So it's it's always there. Um, if they lose money, it's probably gonna come out of the uh, unallocated earnings first. If for some reason the co-op were to go bankrupt, this would be the last amount that gets paid. And so, you know, you would pay off all the creditors first, all any other preferred shares, and then and then this would be, whatever's left would get 
the board would have to figure out how to pay that out. But it's it's there. So and it's yeah right. It's it's at risk money to be used however the co-op feels it should be used. Although you know in your bylaws you can you can make some, you know, you can write into your bylaws uh, some language about limits on that, and you can even build in um, a retention. Like I would I would recommend you know even for capital for co-ops that have hard capital needs, to even then try to keep a seven year rollover going where you're never keeping money for more than seven years and just keep it flush. But it's about really managing capital more than, you know, more than probably most people think about when they think about co-ops. They often think about the worker rights end of it, but this is the other end of it that you still have to manage that capital flow. Okay, and so finally, just to give an example of this, I'm hoping my animation is gonna work right. In a worker co-op, uh, people wear kind of three different hats. So your worker hat, you know, when you have that extra money, it's about, you know, should you raise wages or not? The workers might say, you know, I can use more cash in my life. I got bills and things. Um, but the owner hat might say, you know, if we have less wages, maybe there's more patronage at the end of the year and we don't have to, we have a different tax rate for that. We don't have to pay unemployment insurance on patronage. You don't have to pay social security on wages. And it's actually more money at the end of the year for people that's more unencumbered. And then the manager might say, you know, we actually need more equipment. We need better equipment. We need to replace our vehicles or improve our uh, uh, our safety program. And so it's it's really trying to balance these three hats that everyone's wearing, and uh, and that's where coming together and talking about it and, and figuring it out is the, to me part of the fun part of co-ops is it really creates that uh, dynamic of. Um, there's not an us and them, it's all of us at the same time, and everyone's kind of got three or more personalities. On the downside, I, I think the biggest downside is for co-ops when they ignore or don't engage the values and principles, that this leads right into what's called isomorphism, which is the tendency to start looking at your competitors as the model and following them, and that separates the business and the co-op from being one organization. And that can really lead you down a road of trying to look like your competitors. And that's usually leads co-ops into a market that they can't compete in because they're never going to be able to, you know, uh, Mondragon, for instance, went out of the business of making refrigerators because it just got to the point where the only way to be competitive was to slash wages. And that's not what they're there for. So they closed the business down. Agency dilemma, sometimes called the agency problem. It's really more happens in consumer co-ops, but it's also if you have a disengaged membership where the management uh, tends to really know what's going on, um, it can be really hard for the board to feel it has power because the manager might be the one that actually knows the industry. So like for instance, the board of a food grocery co-op, probably most people on the board have no idea what it takes to run a grocery co-op. So how can they, what do they have to do to actually be able to oversee the management? of a grocery store when they don't necessarily know how to run it. Uh, likewise, you know, if a, dis, um, a dispersed workforce may not be able to see what's happening in the back of the house that keeps everything flowing. That happened, you know, that was often a dilemma at Union Camp. You know, drivers didn't always understand why manager was making the decision he was making. <clears throat> and that kind of falls into, you know, committing to education, uh, really making sure that members know what's going on, understanding the model. Um, and that can help over that can either help overcome some of these issues or it can or lack of it can lead to it more. I throw in gentrification just because uh, consumer co-ops kind of get into this problem where they're asked to come into a food desert and they bring in this very uh, white space into a community that they don't really have any connection to and it ends up gentrifying the neighborhood and being sort of the shock troop of gentrifications. This happened a lot in uh, New York and Brooklyn and um, in Queens, and it's something that gets talked about a lot. Again, it's how co-ops do that is going to be the difference. If they just go in blindly and say, you know, we got our co-op metrics and we're going to get our, you know, um, ninety-dollar uh, organic chickens to sell in a community where, you know, people just don't have that, it's probably going to change things. And then finally, just being too conservative to uh, manage. Sometimes. Um, 
people have a real high risk threshold or low risk threshold, right? And um, because they're worried and they're not used to making changes in a, in a marketplace structure. And so they can be too conservative and, and miss opportunities and, and just not want to make changes, uh, being really change averse. And so it's finding that balance of, and that again goes with knowledge and education and really understanding the industry, but also, um, you know, realize, you know, taking some attitudes that make decisions that are good enough to try, but safe enough for now. And I think all of these can be overcome by working through the values and principles and really making sure communication is there and that there's open and transparency. So that's where they really come alive. And I'll just leave you with a quote from Martin Luther King. So the part of all that civilization has meant and developed is community, the mutually cooperative and voluntary nature of us to assume a semblance of responsibility for all of us. And that kind of goes into, there's Mendy's comment that, or uh, Robert Owen, I think is each for all and all for each. So it's a, a very old concept within cooperation. And then I guess I'll take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. <laughs> you gave me a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my first questions, um, you kind of answered it, like how you pick a structure. Um, you could do some research, but then it's kind of up, up to you to um, like develop the process, the democratic processes within your organization for decision-making. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get too far away from your industry, uh, you know, but, but, you know, just understanding that when you hear best practices in an industry, that's probably not for the, workers of the industry, it's mm -hmm. probably for the shareholders. So, but still, you know, um, a taxi cab is still gonna, you know, for instance, is still gonna be limited by expense per mile and revenue per mile that the industry is. And once you get over a certain expense per mile, it's gonna be hard to, to make ends meet. So yeah, it's, it's thinking about what those structures are and how they can be tweaked, but just, there, you know, where in the industry, what industry you're in is going to help also set that. How do you recommend finding like accountants or like financials? I'm not going to be the person in charge of finances of any of my ventures. How do you go about finding like an accountant or support with somebody who understands cooperative structure? Um, there are actually a growing uh, number of uh, bookkeeping co-ops in the country. Uh, so depending where you are, I know there's one in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, there's one here in Olympia. There's one in New York City, ABC accounting, I think. I believe there's a group in Austin that's actually trying to create a national sort of network of uh, bookkeepers. So that's one option. There's also, um, it's, you know, in a pinch, uh, asking a consumer co-op or an ag co-op who they use to do their, you know, auditing or, or accounting review can be really helpful. At least they at least know that part of the co-op world, and then that can be a good starting spot. Thank you. Oh, what what was um, the question? I, I had technical issues. Yeah, I just asked, um, like, how you find a like how to pick a structure. Um, oh, okay. And then also like how to get financials, like find a bookkeeper or accountants that are familiar oh, okay. with the cooperative structure. Okay. But. Yeah, I mean, one name I can definitely give out is Wegner Associates in Madison, Wisconsin. They are not a co-op, but uh, they are, um, they support co-ops and uh, Bruce Meyer is kind of considered one of the top co-op accountants in the country. and. Uh, he has a blog and he provides a lot of information online about that. Also, we also will tend to use uh, templates from SCORE, which is a service of the Small Business Administration. So SCORE.org, S-C-O-R-E.org. And uh, they have a number of great templates that you can use that will help you work through the numbers. And that's usually one of the first things we do with clients is to work through the financials to, uh, to make sure things are going to pencil out. I had a question if there's time. Um, most of my sort of starting business experiences from the technical world and startup and Bay Area and Silicon Valley stuff. Um, do you have any 
direction for where to be looking um, on that side. I guess I guess I'm thinking about the sort of big picture in the startup world. It's usually you have a few people with a somewhat crazy idea, and so mm -hmm. the deal with the devil is go <laughs> to people who are willing to bet money on riskier things and maybe a lot more money and expect a much bigger return. Do you mm -hmm. have thoughts about, and I've been very depressed watching where Silicon Valley has gone over the last mm -hmm. 15 years. Um, do you have thoughts on sort of worker co-ops in, in that area? Yeah, there, there's, um, there's a growing effort to think about that. Uh, it's, they're called platform co-ops uh, for the most part. So uh, they're a little bit more advanced in Europe. So, uh, so like in Europe, there's a group called fairbnb.coop, which is uh, it's basically a co-op version of Airbnb. So um, there's groups in Canada, I think in New York City, they're just starting an Uber-like uh, driver-owned uh, uh, ride service. Um, it's happening, the, there's a, I think the website is a Platform Consortium Cooperative, uh, if you Google that. So um, some of the people involved with that are folks like uh, Greg Brodsky from start.coop. Um, there, there's a lot of thinking around of how to reclaim that space. I, one of the challenges though is capital and that's always what it comes down to. And, and I would say capital, but also, um, you know, capital is more, it seems about um, finding the money to cover the people to write the software and then promote it. And so that's, you know, so if you can find people that are willing to, you know, engage in sweat equity and maybe working in some sort of preferred model for that they get paid down the road. We're working with a couple different people on ideas. Um, there are some laws, uh, different states have laws. Washington has a law called a limited co-op association, which allows for an investor-based ownership structure um, for part of it. They're secondary to the patronage members who are the ones using the system. That can be useful. You, it's, it would still be patient capital. It would still be um, social capital. It would not, you know, people would not be looking at getting multi-digit or, you know, 10, 20, 30% returns. They'd be looking at maybe long-term, uh, it might be, you know, so, I mean, it's still finding the right people with money who are more interested in the social investment than the get rich, crazy rich investment. But but there are people trying to work that out and, and think about it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, you want to? You have another question? Or? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so, in in you know something that I kind of paid a lot of attention to and kind of studied in college, and uh, it's really important to me in general is kind of the idea of a of human fulfillment within an organization and what, you know, what are the types of structures that lead to that? What are the types of cultures that lead to really being, feeling fulfilled at work? Um, and, um, you know, so on the one hand, I, you know, I, I see with cooperatives that uh, you know, you, you're all a mutual owner. There's that democracy. There's a lot of different structures. Um, uh, it's a very different dynamic than a, a conventional business, though sometimes it isn't. Um, but then also there's a lot more responsibility that, that may come with that and added stress. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking if you, just wondering if you could speak on that in terms of, um, just uh, human fulfillment, uh, mm -hmm. in, in enjoying what you do, uh, enjoying your time uh, in a corporate model versus a cooperative. If you could just speak on that. Yeah, it, you know, I think it's part about uh, being intentional on the culture when you're setting up the organization and, and what you want out of it. And so, you know, UnionCab, we worked a lot to change our initial culture that came out of uh, very uh, antagonistic union fight in, uh, in the 70s. And so, you know, building things like, you know, a mediation uh, concept as an, an alternative, you know, discipline, right? It, it sounds like it's, 
you know, but getting out of that adversarial relationship and really thinking about um, other ways that you can you can engage the organization. So again, at Union Cab, one of the things that we did, and this wasn't formal board policy or anything, it was allowing people to basically, you know, use the co-op's name. Um, being a co-op, we had a lot of artists involved. So uh, people who were in different bands put out uh, three compilation CDs and had a couple uh, shows. You know, it ran it out of, we helped run out the theater and, and promote it. Um, some of the more uh, other artists uh, had, uh, I think, two art openings of their work. And we had three people who were able to write and publish novels. And, you know, part of that was because um, a union cab unlike the rest of the cab industry, people made a living wage on eight hours a week or eight hours a day. Instead of having to work seven 12 hour shifts just to get by, they were able to actually get their hours down to you know, 40 hours a week and they had time to actually explore their other life or, or even sometimes less. Sometimes they could even make what they needed to make on 30 hours a week and, and treat it as, you know, that's what they did to pay the bills, but they could follow their other work. And, but we kind of created that culture. I would say, um, you know, yeah, part of it is, you know, trying to build in that community. It's very, it's not uncommon for a lot of uh, co-op meetings to use uh, that space as a dinner or a party or a social event. So it's not just a business meeting. It, it turns into building those social connections as well. And um, in terms of the work itself, you know, you can, you have the power to make it more humane. Where, you know, and, and that's especially for things like uh, home care co-ops where you're working with a, a senior population, many of whom are only gonna be with you for a few months because they're, you know, they're, they're at their end of the life. And so being able to also build in where that's understanding that, you know, there's these connections that get made, whereas a corporate world may just assign you to the next client and not really worry about it. Co-ops are going to take a little bit more time to give some space for, for understanding that human connection that happens and, um, and helping people through that. So by building structures and, you know, I, there's not really, I guess, you know, way of, one way to do it. I think it's, it's about um, letting it be really organic and, and just really trying to focus that human aspect to it. The, the spiritual founder of Mondragon likes to say that, um, you know, the role of cooperation is to make people more human. And that, that was his uh, concept. Thank you, John. I was thinking that that's really what cooperatives, why I'm attracted to cooperatives is kind of like this sweet spot that you've gone over where, business, where a cooperative can have two missions, where normally those missions are separated by like to for-profit and non-profit and you have to be either or. So the cooperative is kind of like this place where you can care about something and also provide for the people who are making it happen. Right. Yeah, and I would say, you know, the, um, the values and principles, one of my other areas of work is uh, we do this, it's called the co-op index and it's uh, designed to measure how well those values and principles are incorporated into the operations. And, you know, when we're doing the research on it, one of the things we realized is that what we were really measuring was human dignity in the workplace. And that's what it really correlates to. When you look at other measures that follow human dignity, it really just goes right back to the values and principles. So. I have one more question. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the collective inside of a cooperative. So are you meaning that there's like a, the structure of the business is a cooperative, but then maybe the decision-making structure is a collective? Yeah, there, yeah, I didn't really talk about decision making. So, you know, um, there might be a legal structure that's required by the state where you have a board of directors and, you know, that sort of thing. But then internally, you can kind of do what you want. Um, now, there's groups, organiz there's processes like sociocracy that uses a hierarchy of um, work as opposed to power. So if you're like in a cheese department, then you don't really worry about what's happening outside the cheese department unless it affects the cheese department, right? And, that, and that's kind of its own little micro collective. That's kind of how Rainbow Grocery Co-op is organized in San Francisco. They have 12 different collectives that link together to form the co-op. Um, 
consumer co-op, so um, Olympia Food Co-op here in, in Olympia, Washington. They have 12, 15,000 members. They have 80 uh, staff members. The 80 staff members operate as a collective. And then they also have you know, a bunch of volunteer workers. Um, so you know there are different ways of doing it. Um, um, and yeah, I, I should have probably talked a little bit about sociocracy or dynamic governance, but it's kind of operates on this idea of how do you, it allows you to sort of get bigger without losing that democracy within the place. Thank you. We're in like the last five minutes. Do you have any other questions, Emil or Christian? Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, John, what do you see as kind of the, the biggest obstacles for kind of co-ops uh, co becoming a, a larger percentage of businesses? Or is it realistic? Or is it just a there's a, a, a competitive disadvantage where there's a tough limit uh, in terms of maybe startup costs uh, or like, what, yeah, what, what do you say on the, these issues? Um, yeah, I, I would say definitely access to capital is a big issue. Uh, sometimes, I mean, it depends what you're doing. So a home care co-op needs about $50,000 to get started. Most of the people who provide home, co home care are making minimum wage. So if they can find access to that $50,000, then they can get going and it's great. Um, and we try to help. We have a small revolving loan fund, but you know, it's small. I mean, we only have about $100,000 in it. So we can only do about three or four co-ops at a time. Um, the other end I think is, um, you know, people just having the knowledge and the time. I mean, right now we're living in a time when it's probably never been easier to start a co-op. There are groups like I'm involved with, and Cooperation Works. There are more cooperative development people out there and experienced co-op people that can assist than have ever existed right? since whenever. And you know, it's like when Union Camp started, there were, the only people we had to talk to were folks working with farmer co-ops and they had no idea what to make of cab drivers. But today there are literally thousands of people that know how to talk to cab drivers, right? And so there, and there's a lot more models. Like, so for education, I, Forgot to mention, but Ed Visions in Minnesota, they are a network of uh, teacher owned charter schools that feed into a system. Uh, the teachers own and run the, the schools, and they use a very alternative teaching method where it's team teaching and you know, no grades, but you know, deliverables of where students, even in first grade, are spend the year learning and then they report back and teach back what they learned. So, um, you know, so it can be done. It's just, it's, I think the, that's the other thing is that there are more examples now than ever. There's almost every sector has a co-op that you can look at and say, oh, this is how they're doing it. So it works. Now that we can do it the way we want to do it and, and make it, you know, tweak it. So that's the other thing is, I think getting the word out, it's very hard. We, most of our co-op development centers do not have money for marketing or promotion. So being able to do events like this, we love it because it's a chance to, you know, even if we only reach another 100 people, that's 100 people. And if they reach 100 people, you know, it can grow. But yeah, so I would say mostly initial capital um, and then, um, you know, access, knowing where to find uh, access to, to developers who have the time and ability to help. So, What was the name of that education? Ed Visions. Ed Visions. Ed Visions, right. And Ed they're in Visions. where? Where are they? They're they're based uh, just outside of Minneapolis. Okay. Yeah, and I, I sent them an email, but I didn't hear back from them. But uh, they might for your group, it might be worth you know really scheduling a meeting with them and and just you know seeing. I was going to think about showing they have like a three minute video too. That's uh, it's probably worth watching. It kind of shows what they do and, and talks about it. Thank you, John. You know. I think that to like my perception of workers co-ops is that people aren't aware of it as a business yeah. structure when they think about starting a business. So, right. and I hope that like having these kind of discussions and thank you so much for joining us um, just to open it up that there are other ways of structuring and your organization and, um, and why you would want to do that just right. for the 
humanities <laughs> like larger goals. And, and I do want to say, you know, I should say that the number of worker co-ops in the U.S. has doubled since like 2014. Wow. So I mean, people are learning, and it's, uh, it's but it's you know we're we got a slow start. <laughs> yeah. And I and I love your question, Emil, because uh, these app like delivery apps during the pandemic, I've just been like. Why isn't there a co-op where like the drivers like log into the app and that is part of the ownership or like something where there isn't just somebody mm -hmm. making a killing off of this interaction that's real simple, right? Yeah, um, if, if there's time, I wanted to build off your last question, Brooklyn. Um, I, I've been reading, you know, various, start a small business kind of thing. My kid has been doing jewelry stuff um, and pretty much everything I see is, uh, you know, sole proprietorship, LLC, corporation. Um, the, on the legal side for a worker-owned co-op, is it you are a corporation and then where do you look for more information about the legal structure beyond that? Yeah, technically, uh, so technically most co-ops are considered C corporations. And then they have what are what's called a subchapter T uh, with the IRS code. So they would be, so like an S corporation is subchapter S where subchapter T's. Um, so um, most states, uh, well, there are a number of states that don't have any co-op law, but you can also be an LLC. So you can be an LLC and write your language to be co-op centric and still be subchapter T possibly, uh, but, um, the states, a lot of states have co-op law, co-op corporation law. So Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin are some of the big ones. Um, and you know, you can you can kind of look it up. I mean, I I should probably make a page linking all of the different laws on our site just so that people can find it. So if you're, just Google yeah. corporation well, law, you know, Oregon, most, basically. Yeah, most states have. Um, most states have a website now where you can actually go and find the actual law and the language and read through it. And depending how well versed you are in reading the legalese, and sometimes they'll even have it in a very readable way. And, uh, and you can kind of see exactly what you need for the bylaws and the articles. And, you know, um, yeah, I should probably make a page for that now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> And perhaps reach out to an organization that's a co op doing what you're doing to get. Absolutely. Yeah, there are almost 37 development organizations now in the United States. Um, so California has a center based out of Davis. Um, we're pretty much the group here from Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, but they're you know, also a Democracy at Work Institute. Um, you know, uh, there's groups in New York and in the Northeast, North Carolina just has a new one going. So there are, there are groups almost everywhere. Go ahead, Emil. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really appreciate all the info. It's been uh, been really interesting. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. And Absolutely. the clock, which should probably close up and respect your time. For well, sure. Well, and you know, of course, um, you know, if there's any other things you need from us, I mean, we're here as a resource, and so you know, feel free to point people our way or, or think about it. If, you know, there's other questions that the group might have going forward. For Thank more specific trainings, we can probably do something. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Really appreciate your time. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Hey. Happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>